what makes the Federal Reserve's path to yeah, that soft landing we all dream of, a little hazy. Economic indicators are sending mixed signals to the central bank. The U.S. jobs market is incredibly strong. We know that more than a half million jobs were created last month alone. GDP, though, on the other hand, it's shrank for two consecutive quarters now. And by some definitions, you know, that is the sign of a recession. And now we have that consumer price index, and it shows inflation may be slowing. Diane Swank is chief economist at KPMG, and she joins me now. Uh, always good to have you, but especially on a day like this to help us make sense of some of this. Now, the market has already weighed in. They like these numbers because they feel it may mean the Fed does not have to be as hawkish going forward. Where do you stand on that? Actually, I think the Fed's going to be still very hawkish going forward. It's easy to get inflation from sort of the lofty highs we've seen from 6% core inflation, stripping out those volatile food and energy prices, which are still important, down to 4%. That isn't a hard move to make. It's much harder to get it from 4 to 2 And why do we care about that? Well, once we get around 2%, it's not affecting our daily lives as much. It's not distorting our behaviors and our decisions. And that's the Fed's ultimate goal. And and I think the reason you see the Fed, actually people in the Fed coming out and saying, hey, we still look like we're going to be raising rates for a while and we're going to be holding them high for a while. It's because they want to not just get inflation down. They want to get it down to a level that it's not significant in distorting our everyday behavior as it is today. Yeah, and it's such a good point to make because even when we talk about things like food, we, we have noticed, right, a shift away from certain proteins because they like beef because they become so expensive. Now, I, I do want to get your input on the dysfunctionality of the current economy in general. Can we even read the indicators right now in historical terms? And, and I want to point out that Larry Summers, once again, repeating today that, OK, these, this data looks OK, but everything that we see is still largely volatile. What do you think? Well, I think it's important to understand, first of all, the two negative quarters in a row. The only other time we had two negative quarters in a row, and it was not considered a recession by the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the economist definition, not the public's definition, was in 1947. When we were coming out of World War II, we saw a big drawdown in defense spending, a big drawdown in inventories, but consumer spending and employment continued to power ahead. In the second quarter of this year, and even in the first quarter, domestic demand held up in the second quarter little bit, but not in all categories. We saw the housing market cratered, investment flatlined, and consumer spending slowed. That is the same time that employment continued to go ahead, so it doesn't qualify as a recession. But for most workers out there, their wages, they lost them to this inflation and then some since the onset of the pandemic, uh, open, reopening since the pandemic um, sort of started to abate. That is why they feel like they're losing ground. They actually feel like we're in a recession, even though it's not what a economists classify a recession, and it heightens the need that the Federal Reserve has to really get inflation much lower and not distorting our everyday lives and dominating our everyday lives. The question is, of course, does that mean an increase in the unemployment rate? And sadly, I think it does. I think we're at that stage of the game, even though we got this cooling. One of the things Fed Chair Jay Powell is worried about is ongoing pressures on food prices and gasoline prices. Those could come back at any time. Russia could weaponize its oil exports yet again. Those are things they're worried about because at this late stage, it's gone on for so long that it threatens to become something like we saw in the 1970s, more entrenched. And Jay Powell addressed this issue at his press conference, said, hey, we can't grow food, we can't pump oil, but we can hammer demand to get it down to a supply-constrained world. And that's sadly in the place that they still feel they are, even after today's data. And so could, given everything that you've just said, can I get your take then on the fiscal component on this? I mean, we have some legislation in the United States that looks like it'll pass. It is, in fact, called the Infl Inflation Reduction Act. But, you know, even places like Moody's are pointing out that, look, th this will not lower inflation in the short term uh, at all. Do you think there will be some help there on that side, on the legislative side? Or, or do you think this is just... You know, we're trying to heal from this uh, pandemic economy and that it's still going to take much more time than anyone wants it to. 
Well, I think all of the above are absolutely true. There's no question that the inflation we're feeling is part of the pandemic, and it's going to continue to be a residual of both pandemic aid and the pent-up demand that we created and the distortions and supply chain disruptions that we had. So it's all of the above. I do think it is important that we are dealing in real time with climate change. And that is something that adds to inflation over time because it causes you know, famine, floods, fires, all the things that disrupt supply chains and disrupt our access to that very one thing that you focused on the most, food. And I think that's really important to understand about where we're at. And so going forward, anything that focuses on getting a transition that's more palatable away from things that make climate change worse towards renewables is really important in containing inflation. And that's where we do need to go longer term. Otherwise, we're going to have a longer term that deals with more shortages, more critical shortages that get to the very basics of life. Yeah, and the global economy in a tough spot where that is concerned, especially given the energy crisis created, of course, by the war in Ukraine. Anne Swank, really good to see you. And